All right, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, and let's pray together. Father God, I'm uh, always amazed at you, but uh, sometimes you really capture attention more than other times. And honestly, in the scheme of things, this is, I mean, you moved to sea to get your people across dry land. It's, this is nothing. Um, you, you brought your Savior into the world through the, the womb of a virgin. And sadly, we can say those things, but it's kind of hard for our minds to grab them. So we kind of put them in the, we believe it, but we don't know how. Or we don't, you're an amazing God. And uh, not only that, this salvation is greater than we can ever really truly understand here. But as we apply our minds, as we surrender our thoughts to you, Lord God, that's where the transformation happens. So I'm asking you to transform our minds and our hearts by the knowledge of who you are and what you have done, Lord God. Because who we worship, we will become like. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's... Um, Let's start at uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. It's a little bit, a little bit long of a verse, but we're going to read it together. Um, Hebrews 10, 1. For the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the reality themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeatedly, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise would they have not been stopped being offered? For the worshiper would have been cleansed once, cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt the guilt for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings. You were not pleased. And then I said, here I am, for it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though that they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He has set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will... We have been made holy. That's a great thing to underline. By what he has accomplished throughout generation, he has made us holy. You're not holy in yourself, and neither am I. We do not stand here under our own credit. It's his. He has given it as a gift. That's the point of salvation. He has set aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ Jesus. Once and for all. That's a perfect present tense. It's called aorist tense. That means it was done from eternity past and it was already brought into finality in heaven. That's why we may be seated here, but in reality, the Bible tells me I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Don't know how that can be. I don't feel like I'm in heaven, but I am. That's why Martin Luther called us uh, simul ustis, uh, wait a minute, simul ustis peccator. That means I'm, I'm a sinner and simultaneously a saint. That's the truth of Christianity. You feel the struggle in your own life, do you, or am I the only one? Because I do. I still feel the struggle of it. I still feel the struggle of wanting to choke people. I still feel the struggle of being impatient. I still feel the struggle of selfishness. But yet I also know that there is an impetus on my life for a greater purpose. To be surrendered unto God. Let's keep moving. Okay. Day after day the priest stands and performs their religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices. Which can never take away sins. And when the priest had offered for all times one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made a footstool. footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Once again, I'm going to explain that in the sermon. 
because it, it sounds a little confusing, but I want you to understand it. The Holy Spirit testifies to this about us. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put their laws in their, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on my mind, on their minds. And then he said, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sin, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, there's always the big therefore. If Christianity doesn't have a therefore for us, we have to ask the preacher, where's the therefore? I need to know the law. Why? Therefore, it can take me to Christ. We have to know the therefore. And it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have such a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Praise be to God right there. I know I stopped in the middle of, uh, of a statement and that's not always the wisest thing to do, but I've got a point to it. Um, the, the sermon title here is the best, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And one of the things is that for us to understand parts of the Bible, we have to understand the whole Bible. It's not, uh, they're, they're individual parts but if we, take, if we take the Bible and we kind of do one of these numbers where we kind of like scroll through it and go, and we try to understand, it would be like understanding a story from the middle of it. You wouldn't quite get it. For us to understand the Bible, we have to understand that this is one story. This is one story written through millennia. It's written through uh, generation after generation. It's written through the lives of thousands of individuals. It is the story of God and of his greatness and how he generously wants to share his glory with his people. God has a greater Eden for his people. Oftentimes we may hear this, and this is my theory. I think there's a few other teachers out there that teach this. But uh, normally teachers believe that God is bringing us back to Eden. I do not believe he's taking us back to Eden. I believe he's taking us to a greater Eden. Because, it, hear me out, if God were bringing us back to Eden, sin is still a possibility. But where God is taking us to, where God has ensured for us to be, there is no possibility of sin. That's my greatest joy. The idea that one day... I will no longer feel the impetus of hostility toward God. I will no longer feel distrust toward him. I will no longer feel anxiety toward God. I will surrender to him. I will know the joy of being completely surrendered or lost in God. That's heaven. That's heaven. It's not seeing my aunt, my uncle, my dog when I was nine. That's not heaven. My heaven, our heaven, is being surrendered to him, being surrendered and lost in him, where honestly, I'm still me and you're still you, but somehow we're united in a way we've never felt before. And honestly, this is what we were created for. So it's like the screwdriver that finally understands the reason that it was created. It's no longer pounding nails. It's actually doing what it was created to do. Does that make sense? All right, last week, we understood that God... He revealed himself in, in, in the Garden of Eden. We saw this, that he wanted us to find confidence in his correction and restoration. God wants us to find confidence in the fact that he's restoring us, he's correcting us. See, oftentimes, I, just, I, I don't want to take too long, but we have this idea of thinking freedom means I can do whatever I want. But everyone in this room knows that's not the truth. You know, I think I told you this before. There was a teacher at our old uh, church. Her name was Carol. And she asked her kids, what is freedom? And the one kid said, well, it's doing whatever you want. And she said, okay, well, my neighbor plays the, the music at 3 o'clock in the morning every night when, it comes home, when they come home from work. I'd like to actually burn their apartment down. Is that okay? And they were like, oh, Miss Crabb, you can't do that. That's not good. And she goes, but wait a minute. You told me that freedom was to be able to do anything I wanted to do. And they were like, oh, I, I didn't think of that. So the one kid asked, 
the one kid was sitting there, and she said it's funny because he was actually the, the not the, I don't want to say it meanly, but he wasn't the smartest in the room. And uh, he said, when I think of freedom, I think of my dog. And everyone's like, what? And she goes, when my dad takes my dog for a walk, he doesn't use a leash. He goes, that dog can go anywhere it wants, but it stays five feet from my father. When it gets to the edge of the street, it looks to my dad before it even thinks to walk into that street because he has learned to trust everything that his master brings him to. He knows that all of his provision is found in his master. That's freedom. That's what God wants us to find in our salvation because he is taking us from chaos and disorder to safety and prosperity. Number two, we, God wants us to enjoy uh, uh, him in his desire for us to dwell in peace. Remember what I talked about. Peace isn't just placidity. There's no, you know, no, no winds, no waves. That's what we think we want. But honestly, do you think you'd really be satisfied if you never had struggle in your life? I think for a short amount of time you may. You know, I, I could tell you another story. There was a big fish courier that was bringing fish from the West Coast to the East Coast. And every time they would bring these shiploads of fish over to the other, the fish would be dead and they would be corrupted by the time they got to their location. They're like, well, what do we do? We're packing them in fresh water. What are we supposed to do? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. So they hired a scientist and the scientist said they have no reason to swim around when they're in this container. So what you need to do is you need to put a predator in that tank with them to keep them on their toes. But the lady, but the, 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 the owner of the company goes, but the predator is going to kill some of the fish. It's okay that it kills some of the fish. It won't kill all of the fish. But the ones that live will be healthier. There's a part of struggle that is part of the mechanism to perfection. But God wants us to live in peace. What does that mean? Peace is harmony where I put my hands down and I surrender my life. I surrender my minutes, I surrender my time, I surrender my talents, I surrender my treasures, and I give them to him because I realize he's the one who has given them to me for his use. And when I give them back to him, what I find is greater fulfillment in the use of them. I find contentment. If you lack contentment in your life, it's a good chance you're fighting with God. There's a good chance you're fighting with God. Three, God wants us to find peace in his sovereignty. Remember what I told you? God had a plan from beginning to end. I love the book of Ephesians, my favorite book in all of the Bible, because it tells me that before anything in all creation was made, God had a plan, and it was already complete. And we were part of that plan. We were part of that plan. The elect were called to be with him in eternity from before anything was made. Now, I know that there's a lot of people who argue with me all the time. That's not true. We have free will. And I go, you have free will to sin apart from grace. You can say and think whatever you want, but you and I had this much to do with our salvation. The only thing we brought to God for it was our sin. It's the truth. That's what I see. Fourth thing, we, God wants us to enjoy him, his person, by dwelling in his love. God wants us to know this love in a way that fulfills us. Honestly and truthfully, that's the reason we were created. We were created to enjoy his love. Now, all these other things are aspects of his love, but we have to know that love. If you are not connected with his love, then there's a danger of having Christianity be another religion. You know, one of the things that we understand about the Jews is they did have an understanding of God, but unfortunately, they struggled with intimacy. When Jesus would call God Father, they would be overwhelmingly insulted. They're like, how dare you call God your Father? Because they could struggle with seeing God as a Father who loved and cared but this is the truth. God wants to embrace his children. He calls us his beloved. And this is how we will find joy. We will find strength. It's like a little kid. 
Little kids grow up in healthy homes when they know their parents love them. And when they do not know that, trust me, children are in for rough times ahead because those are foundational things. Those build confidences in you. And if those are robbed from you, you're in for a rough life. You're in for a rough life. You'll, you'll wind up constantly be searching for it your whole life. All right. So I said this last week, and I'm going to say it again, so you're going to hear it a lot during this sermon series. God created us to be in intimate relationship with him. This is his desire. This Christmas, we must ask, 2021, we must ask, are we living in intimate relationship with God? How does that happen? We don't need to overly spiritualize it. We don't. We can bring it right down to brass tacks. How are you intimately connected to anyone? It starts with talking. You have to communicate. And you're not just communicating by talking at someone, you're talking with them. That means I'm telling you things that are deeply embedded in me. Intimacy, as my old pastor used to say, he defined it as into me see. That means I'm going to open this up without fear because we don't like to do that because if I really open this up, you're going to see something that you might take advantage of or I might be embarrassed of, or you might turn away from, right? So I open it up and I say, into me see, Lord, into me see. And when we read his scripture, we see into him. We see into him. That's what God wants in our relationship. Last week we found because of the fall, mankind was kicked out of Eden, and God placed a guarding cherubim in the garden to prevent man from re-entering this eternal symphony. That's what Eden was. It was a place where God says, you were in harmony with me, now you can't be in harmony with me. Why? Because he had a better harmony planned for us. I don't even know how that could be. God's plan is bigger. We always have to remember that God's plan is bigger. If you're finding yourself in a position where you have lost something, do not lose hope. Do not lose hope. God's plan is bigger. Even losses in the hands of your Savior are a good thing. He may not give you a better job, but he will give you a better life. If, if, and this is a big if, if you trust him in it. You know what? When I was wanting to come, there was nothing that wanted to prevent me from being here. Nothing. I didn't. But I realized as the days were going, I'm like, I don't know if this is going to happen. They're like, I don't know if I can release you. And you know what I said to God? I go, God, this is your kingdom. I'm just here because you allow me to be here. I don't deserve it. And if you want me to be here, I'll be here. And I literally put my hands to my side and said, your will be done. I pushed the doctor a lot of times, but that's okay. <laughs> but that's Okay. You know what? I put my hands to my side. And then here's the best. He finally comes in at the last hour, growing my faith, strengthening my faith, bringing me, pulling me in faith. And it was the last hour. And they go, well, we don't even know if you're going to get out in time, but we're going to release you right now. And you know what I did? I waited. It was 10, 15. And I'm like, man, I go, oh, this lady got to get in here. And then I thought to myself, would God have taken me this far to leave me here? I want you to remember that when you're struggling because you're going to struggle. You know, that's part of it. I told you, if you don't struggle in the pond, you're going to die. You'll become diseased. That's not the way it's supposed to be. God's plan is leading his elect to a perfect salvation and to a perfect savior. It always has been the plan. Always. I discussed this with someone the other day and they were like, well, I thought Eden was supposed to be perfect, and if there would have been no sin in Eden, then we would have had no need for salvation. And I go, do you honestly believe that this is the purpose of creation? So it was somehow a plan B? Like, well, God's up in heaven, and he's like, well, I'm going to give all these good things to Adam and Eve, and then they're going to screw it up, and now I'm going to be like, oh, what am I going to do next? No, no, no. It was always God's plan to bring us to Jesus. Jesus wasn't, well, now what do I do? Jesus was always, this is what I'm going to do. This is my number one plan. I want us to remember that God loves his people, but he loves his glory more. 
He loves his glory more. And I'm going to tell you something. I know that that's something that really kind of rubs us the wrong way. Nobody likes someone who loves themselves most. But I'm going to explain to you something about that. We need to remember that God lives in his glory. All of his being resides in his glory. All of his creation prospers in his glory. That's why God created us. In Genesis 1.1, it said, God said, let there be light. Remember, that's the first words in the Bible. God said, let there be light. But four days later, he creates the sun and the stars. So what light was he creating? Well, I have an idea what that light is. I believe that light is a physical manifestation of God's glory. This light is a life-giving source for all good things. Now, I want to explain something. John 1, 9, he says this about Jesus. This is John speaking about Christ. He says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, but his own received him not. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right or legal claim. That's what that right means. It's not like, well, yeah, now you can do it or you're able to do it. It means, no, now it's your legal right when you believe in him to become children of God. I want us to remember, always remember this, that God is a divine father that loves, leads, guides, protects, and provides for his children. If you can get to that intimacy with God, your life will be more fulfilled. You may struggle in your marriage. You may struggle with your finances. You may struggle with your health. But if you believe that he loves you, leads you, guides you, protects you, and provides for you, none of these things will defeat you. None of these things. These things are only blessings if you have his love and nearness first. If that's not there, then all these things are, are curses because you have to keep them. They have to fulfill you. They have to be all for you. I feel sorry for women when they say, my children are my everything. Really? What are you going to do when they're gone? I feel sorry for people who say, my business is my everything. What happens when the economy crashes? See, I have a God, and if I have him, all these things become blessings because they're interchangeable. See, I don't necessarily not want them. They're great. I, I love all the other stuff. But if he's not there, the giver of all these things, the one who helps me to understand the real true value of them, then all I'm doing is wasting my whole life trying to keep them in my hands. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Eden is now lost. Is it possible that God, God had no knowledge of the events that would happen and now God, the God of the universe, would have to scramble to fix what Satan sabotaged and man would lose? Listen to what God says about himself in Isaiah chapter 46.10. I am God, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times things yet not done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose. These are rock solid ground for all of his elect. You know who the elect are? I'll tell you, you'll know you're his elect. I'm sorry. If you are called to his purpose and you love him. Are you called to his purpose? Do you love him? Do you demonstrate love? You know, listen, we know when we love somebody. We spend time with them. We want to spend time with them. We don't avoid them, right? When someone doesn't want to call me, it's not because they're busy. It's they don't got time. They got time for other things, but not me. Let's just call it what it is. God is saying that he's never surprised. In that verse, he's saying, I am never surprised. My plan was formulated and completed before one thing was brought into creation. And if we believe that, our love will manifest itself into a life of surrender, and surrender produces peace 
and rest. Do you want to have rest? You know what the number one killer of humanity is? Stress. It causes all the disease. Why? Because we're always stressed about this and we're worried about that. And we eat poorly, which brings this even lower and puts more pressure on us. Surrender always produces rest. It always produces rest. Our God wants us to enter into rest. That's the whole book of Hebrews tells us. Our Father is leading his chosen to Christ, the true tabernacle. Jesus is the great solution for mankind's problem. Everything in the, the tabernacle was just like the garden points to a greater reality. It was created specifically, and it's to show us the, the magnificence of the whole plan of the gospel. And here it is. Let's, let's pop up that. This is what it would have looked like in the desert. Remember how I told you last week, God said, I want to live in your presence? That's great. But the reality is, this would have been, from this wall to these tents, it would have been about 180 feet. You weren't allowed to walk past these tents. Why? Too unclean. So let's look at these parts of the, of the tabernacle and understand what they represent. First of all, let's look at the outer walls. They're walls that are held up by brass brackets and a brass beam that holds up these linen walls. This represents the problem. The great problem of humanity is God's holiness. I told you that last week, but I'm going to say it again. You know, one of the things that prevents us from being surrendered is we don't really believe we're sinners. Ah, I'm imperfect. Ah, nobody's perfect, though. No, you're a sinner. And if God were here, apart from grace, we would be consumed. That's the truth. Do you know why I'm here today? Because I know I'm a dreadful sinner apart from grace. I have connected to the power that Paul had. You know why? Because I know my holiness is not my own. I don't deserve to be here. I have no right to be here. But I've been called to be here. That means people could come in and go, Fitzmorris, you've got no right to be here. And I go, sorry, it's not your call. It's not mine either. See, it's a beautiful thing to be connected to this power. <laughs> The walls represent the problem. God's holiness is a danger to a sinful and corrupted flesh. There is a hostile enmity between the unregenerate and the divine. It stems from our struggle for sufficiency. I want you to understand something about sin. When we think of sin, we think too small. We think cursing sin, stealing sin, unfaithfulness is sin. We think, uh, well, let me write, I got a few other things here. Uh, we think lying's a sin, cheating's a sin, stealing's a sin. But these are merely symptoms. Do you know what the real cause of sin is? Just like cancer. Did you know you can't die from cancer? You die of the things that it allows in our life. Like you usually die of pneumonia because it brings your resistance low. You don't die from the cancer. But the cancer weakens you to the point to where you do bring these things into your life that kill you. Same with sin. Sin, at its core, is a belief that I do not need God and I am sufficient in myself. Is anyone guilty of that here? Because I am. I am. And you know what? I prove it in a thousand ways. A thousand ways. I don't even have to speak it because I wouldn't want to speak it. See, that's the truth. That's the truth. Let's look at the next part. The opening of the doors. How does that start? It starts with the poorness of spirit. Remember in the, in the, in the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What does that mean? That is the person who has come to the belief, the absolute foundational belief, that on my own I am doomed without your mercy. There's Thousands of people in Christian churches that will not be allowed in heaven. Do you know why? They've never been poor in spirit. They're religious. They look outwardly holy. They've even produced fruit in keeping with the Bible. But they've never 
ever learn their desperate condition apart from him. Why do you talk about sin all the time? Because you can't get to the grace without recognizing the problem. That's the issue. It's not like I want to drag us back to the gutter, but we have to understand who we are apart from it to understand the glory of what we've been given. Does that make sense? So listen, the poorness of spirit is a recognition of our desperate estate. My problem with the idea of choosing Jesus, well, just choose Jesus, come forward. You know, I've asked, been asked this a thousand times, why don't you ever have an altar call? You know why I don't have an altar call? Because I don't believe him. You don't choose Jesus. I've seen tons of people come forward crying, oh my God, I love God, I just can't do it, my head's dying and I'm just hurting. And then six months later, they're gone. You know how you know when you're the real deal? When you hear, you believe, and you stay. And you start to produce the fruit of salvation. And it doesn't end. It may slow down at times. It may be difficult at times. But it's always producing. Just want to let you know that. We do not have a choice in picking Jesus. It's kind of like I don't have a choice in breathing. Either I breathe and live or I don't and die. That's the choice of Jesus. Either we accept him and live or we don't and die. Period. Let's look at those doors. They represent God's desire for his beloved to draw near. Do you know one of the things that's hardest for us is when we have tasted rejection from foundational relationships. A father who was distant. A father who abandoned. Even worse than that, a mother who abandons. You know, these are difficult times. You know what that does to you? Psychologists will tell you, you will grow up with a, in, in, like a huge hole that you will forever try to fill. I will always feel that I'm not good enough in myself. You'll always be on this repetitive drive to prove that you're worth something. You'll always be clamoring for things. And then, you know how you know that you got this? When you face rejection, it will cripple you. It will cripple you. I was rejected. And I'm telling you, I searched. I searched. I hated rejection. I would become 30 different people to hang out with the people I wanted to hang out with. But not so with Christ. Not so with our salvation. Not so with our Savior. God desires for his beloved to draw near. One of, it, one of the manifestations of God's goodness is that he created us in his image. Why would he have created us? The least impressive of all the things that he created. Let's be honest. You ever seen a mountain? You ever seen the ocean? You ever seen the stars? Do you think you're as magnificent as they? I mean, these are magnificent things, right? They're huge. But you are made in his image. You. That means he can speak to you in a way only you can hear. What? Yeah, it gets better. One of the manifestations of God's goodness is that he created us in his image. Not because he needed to complete himself. God was complete in himself. Why then, we have to ask, why did he create us? Because one of God's nature is perfect love. God says this, if you want to know who I am, I am love. Well, here's a truth of love. You cannot be the consistency of love if you have no focus for love. So God created us so that we could be the focus of his love. God wouldn't be a God of love and a great God had he not created us. It would have been a crime. He would have cheated himself if he had not made us in his image to be the focus of his love. Tell me when was the last time you focused, you felt the focus of his love? How do you feel it? Do you rejoice in it? Do you lay on your bed and think about how he loves you? At the end of the day, do you feel the bed underneath you? Do you feel the roof over your head? Do you think about your children? Do you think about your family? Do you think of all, your, all the blessings in your life and see them as a result of your father caring for you? Because I want you to. Because he wants you to. 
Here, it goes even better than that. Do you think of your struggles and say to yourself, this is a manifestation of your love for me? What? Struggles? Hard times? They're a manifestation of, of your love for me? Yes. Yes, because these things save me. They, they grow my faith. They make me more Christ-like. They produce perseverance. See, this is the greatness of our salvation. John said, okay, let's, let's think about this door uh, for just a second. John, John, Jesus said this in John chapter 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. What I want you to understand is the new temple is not like the old temple. The old temple had a back. That's not the way it is anymore. You now enter into the presence of God and you go out into the world. We live currently in his presence. It's quorum Deo. That means God is with us all the time. He is always available to us. He is always having his ear near to us. He's always willing. It's like he's waiting for us. You know what I want us to do this month, next month, and, and the months after? I want us to set an alarm on our phone. Seven in the morning, seven at night. Five minutes. Just sit there and say thanks. You know, Lord God, help me to create a mental list of all the ways that you love me. Seven and seven, that's all you got to do, five minutes. You know what, prayer doesn't have to be these huge things. It doesn't have to be a litany. It just has to be serious. It has to be real. It has to be from the heart. It has to be sincere. Let's keep moving. Jesus is our entrance to Psalm 23, remember? Because these open doors are there for us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want for he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He brings me to pure, quiet waters. I love the imagery. That means he's constantly bringing me to a new place where I can feed on good, healthy things. He takes me to rivers where he actually creates an eddy so I don't get swept down the river so I can drink heartily and deeply from this clean water. It's constantly rushing in. Let's keep moving. Let's look at the next part, the altar of burnt offerings. Could you go back to that for the, the I want to go back to the, the altar of the burnt offerings. That would have been right here. That's where all of Israel would have brought their sacrifices. Thank you, Kent. Let's look at that and what that represents. God makes it clear to his people, without the spilling of innocent blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. The great problem with this sacrificial system was, as we read today, it was always simply a temporary fix. We walked out of the temple the same way we walked in, imperfect, still hopeless, and excluded from God's presence. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine being a devout Jew and wanting to feel the burden of your sin being left off? You have to bring in a sacrifice. You bring in the sacrifice, and you feel good for about five minutes until your kid gets on your nerves, until you argue with your wife, right? until a guy cuts you off in that, uh, <laughs> with a candle in front of you. you know? Then you're just right back where you were, and you're like, oh, crap, i got to do this again. That's the way it worked. But when we come and we confess, the sins are already forgiven. They're already forgiven. They're already made an atonement for. We have no reason to walk with our heads low because we feel this weight of shame. How many people walk around with the weight of shame from their past? How many Christians can't seem to walk away from bad decisions that they did so many years ago? In Christ, they're gone. I can walk with my head up. It doesn't matter what my partner says. It doesn't matter what my neighbor says. It doesn't matter what my own conscience says. I have been sprinkled with the blood of the lamb, and now I am clean. Praise God. Praise God. Let's look at this next part. In Hebrews 1, 18, it says, When he came into the world, he said, Sacrifices... And offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, you took no delight in them. Then I said, 
Here I am, I have come, for it is written of me in the scroll, in the book, to do your will. That's how we're made right. The sacrifice that makes us perfect is his life. It's his perfection. It's his sacrifice. And we get all the benefit from it. Let's keep moving. Jesus is, is, is for God's people both the altar and the sacrifice. Now he becomes our good shepherd. And because we are his beloved, our good shepherd gives his life for his friends. Do you know what it says that he does in heaven every day for us? Constantly intercedes. His Holy Spirit lives inside of us, moaning on our behalf. When you and I don't know what to pray, he knows what to pray. He moans and speaks to God the Father on our behalf for us, knowing fully what we need and able to speak in a way that you and I can't even come close to. His salvation is great. It's a great salvation. Let's look at the next part, the great laver or the bronze sea. What would this sea be? Remember, bronze is always a symbol of judicial authority. It means perfection. So the great basin was meant to be a place of ceremonial cleansing. Each priest would wash himself there daily before they tended to the temple duties. But now for us, Christ is the means by which we, his priests, are cleaned and kept clean. In Hebrews 10, 14, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now it sounds like there's a process there, but I'm going to say it again. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect. Perfect tense. So one sacrifice made us perfect for how long? For how long? For how long? For how long? Forever. It means I don't have to live with this burden over my head anymore. Now I'm free. I can focus on the life that he wants me to live. I can focus on loving people the way he wants me to live, not living in regret, constantly looking in my rearview mirror. And now for us, wait, I'm going back. For by one sacrifice, here, I'm sorry, I lost my point. Uh, now Christ is the means for which we have been cleansed. All of his priests, I, I'm sorry, I lost my point. It doesn't matter. Um, so I'm a little bit under the weather today. All right, the thing about this cleansing water, let's talk about that for just two minutes. We've got another five minutes, so I want to be quick. This isn't just a mechanical process. Back then, the priests would come in, and they would dip their hands, and they would wash their head, and they would pull this water over their head. But it was mechanical. But now I want you to remember that the water that we receive that, that cleanses us is given to us in a personal way. So it's like this. When we're in time of need, Christ is right there, and we look to him and we say, we need this water to cleanse us. We need this water to shower over us right now. So he's constantly giving it out from himself. What happened? Do you guys remember what happened on the cross at the last point? What, what happened? So he's up on the cross, and they check to see if he's dead. How did they do it? They stabbed him. Do you remember what happened? Water broke from his, uh, his, his cardiac sac. And it's sprayed out on the people. That water has cleansed us. It has washed over us. We are now clean. We are perfect in Christ Jesus. All right, listen. How do we get there? Here, I'll tell you how. Personal daily confession. When you sin, admit it. When you do something wrong, say, I've done something wrong. Help me. Forgive me. You already have it. Done. Forgiven. The next thing is make amends. Go back to that person and make it right. If you need to apologize, apologize. If you need to pay him back, pay him back. If you need to do the right thing, do the right thing. God doesn't want us to live with guilt. Guilt gives him no glory. What he wants us to do is to focus on living right. Why? Because this is what honors him. This is what benefits the world around him. All right? Let's look at the holy place really quickly. Okay, what is the holy place? This is the place that everyone wants to get to, but the only way to get in there is to die to yourself, which nobody really wants to do. You know what that means for me and you? Daily, we must die to ourselves. 
know how you do that? Say no. You know how you could start that? Here's the best way. Govern your lips. Govern your lips. If you can keep this thing under control, you are dying to yourself. Because everything that is in here that comes from here comes out here. Right? So when I'm telling my lips, you can't say that, I am now allowing the Holy Spirit to govern my life. So I immediately go back to my thoughts. And my thoughts say, well, I want to tell this guy something. Or I want to do this to this person. But my lips, there's this part of me that's saying, no, you can't. You can't let that out. Now there's a struggle. There's a war that happens. Right? That's how we die to ourselves. We tell ourselves, no. You can't. No. You don't have the right. I wanted to be impatient for five days in the hospital. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. I wanted to be mean. But you know what else I wanted more than anything? Is for God to be glorified in a time of suffering. So you know what I did? I said a lot of yes ma'ams, no ma'ams. I complimented people as much as I could, and I kept my mouth shut. That's how you do it. You know how you do it when there's an argument in your home? Not have to win. Why? That's right. I don't have to win. You're right. I love you. That's how you do it. All right. Let's look at that holy place one more time. What's the next thing? It is the veil. There's a veil in the holy place. It's 30 feet high, 30 feet wide, and 30 feet long. It's 18 inches thick. What is it made of? It's made of several layers of fine linen and, gray, and goat hair, and it's also made of waterproof skins. Noah was allowed into the presence of God. It would have been dangerous. That's why it was there. But what does that become for us? So it was a barrier to keep everybody safe and out, if apart from grace. What does it mean for you and I? How does Jesus become for us the great veil? Well, he tells us. Jesus said his flesh would be for us the thing that's torn so that we could live in the presence of God. Remember when he breaks that bread on the final supper, he goes, this is my, this is my flesh, which is torn for you. Think about that. He's saying, I want you to feed from my flesh. I want you to benefit from it. In the book of Hebrews, it says that his flesh was the veil. When they whipped his flesh, wham, wham, wham. And they pulled his flesh with this flagell that would rip skin off of him so that you could see his exposed lungs and his kidneys. It represented, it represented the veil that separated us from God. Now you and I can live in the presence of God. Man, we have to practice that. It doesn't come easy. It doesn't come easy. We have to practice it. Why do we want to do it? Why is it important for us to live in the presence of God? Simply put, we become what we worship. If you stay in the presence of God, you will become like him. Let's look at the last part and then we're done. His glory wages war against our pride when we live in his presence. His beauty makes us desire his beauty when we live in his presence. What you desire, you will chase. Chase something long enough and it will transform you. You will cut things off and move in new patterns to get what you're running after. You will value new things to chase what you desire. If you make God your number one pursuit, chasing him will change your life. That's how it's done, folks. See, we want to get changed just by showing up. That's part one, step one. I have to be a part of what God's doing here to be changed. I have to listen. I have to take uh, uh, full advantage of everything that's being given to me. All right, let's finally talk about the Ark of the Presence. Remember, this is the Ark of the Covenant, the one that Indiana Jones went and looked for. All right. What was in it? First of all, there was three things in it. There was the law, there was a shepherd's staff, and there was a manna. Okay? Let's look at how Christ has become those things for us. Now they no longer bring death to us. At one point, the law brought us nothing but death. 
Everybody thinks, well, if I just adhere to the law, then I'll be okay. That's true. But the problem is, you and I can't adhere to the law. We're imperfect. But now, it's no longer a death giver. It's a promise. Before, it's thou shall or else. But for us, it's I promise. God's saying, I promise one day you will love the Lord your God with all your heart. I promise one day you will love your neighbor just like you love yourself. It's a promise for us. When we see the law, it drives us to Christ. It's supposed to bend our knees so that we understand our great and desperate need for him. Every day, we do not live by the law to prove our worth. We live by the law of love. Why? Because we've been loved so greatly. Let's talk quickly about the shepherd's staff. What does that mean? Because that shows the comfort, the comfort of God's committed love for us. He is for us a great shepherd. A shepherd lives with the sheep. He inspects the sheep daily. He pulls them close. Do you know what a shepherd in the Middle East used to do? He used to take the sheep as a fold and put it around his upper chest. And he would walk around with it for four months so that it could smell the shepherd and they could share the smell with each other and it would hear his voice so that when he finally let that, shepherd, that sheep walk on its own, it knew who to follow. That's the way we need to walk with Christ. And finally, what does he become? He becomes our manna, our heavenly food, this food that satisfies us deep within do you find satisfaction being fed by the presence of God, by the glory of God, by the love of God? Because that's what he wants for his children. I went three minutes over, so I'm going to stop. But as you can tell, this is, a, this is an amazing thing. His manna sustains us in every way. How does that happen? How do I get sustained? Through belief. I will never be in need... If I believe that I have more than enough in him. If I think that I'm always in need, then I'll always be in need. But if I'm confident that I have all I need in him, I will never be in need. And he will prove his sustenance for me. So let's stand up and let's worship together. From the 
Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who ascended into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Do you have weaknesses? As I do. That empathy is an amazing word. It means he doesn't know them like we know them, 
but he can empathize with them. It's pretty nice to know. He's able to empathize with our weaknesses, for we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. So when he says to you, I know, that means he really knows. I'm struggling, Lord, I know. I'm, I'm having a hard time, Lord, I know. I'm lost here, Lord, I know. I feel afraid, Lord, I know. Tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. That means he never gave up. So therefore, let us approach the throne of God with grace and with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's do that. Seven and seven. Who's with me? Seven and seven. Set it on your phone. Seven and seven. Five minutes each time. Create a list of gratitude. Find ways that he loves you. Ask him to show you. Ask him to open up your eyes. Let's make this Christmas really about focusing on the one who deserves all the glory. Let's pray. Father God, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that this isn't about me. I'm grateful that this is about you. And you know what else is amazing? Even though it's all about you, somehow you've shared it with us. And Lord God, we get, we get all the cream and you paid all the price. Lord, you are literally squeezed, squeezed like a grape till all the juice came out so that we could drink the wine of your presence. Lord, if I could ask for one thing, it would be for the skill to tell the gospel the way that it should be told. And Lord God, I pray that every time that we sing a song, that it would be aimed directly at you. And I pray that when, when people would come in here, they would be satisfied from the true manna from heaven. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for it all. God, transform us in your presence. In your name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, Lord. You guys have a great day.